Great. Perfect. Sorry, guys. I apologize. My video is off. I have my son with me today. Um, so, Jessica, if you just want to go to the next slide, I can just explain the continuing education credit um, for how we're going to do this for the SAG. Um, so similar to the November 30th Academy session, the Sustainability Affinity Group is now eligible to offer continuing education credits. At this time, it is only approved for RNs, MDs, and PAs. Um, I am working on trying to get social work approval. So to be able to get credit, I will send out the Google Doc through the chat where you can put your attendance on. Um, and then I will also send you the course evaluation link. Once you fill out the attendance sheet, that will then be sent over to the Boston Children's CME department and they will send you a post activity survey. Once you complete that, they will then send you your certificate. Um, if you have any issues or any questions about this, you can send me an email and I'll share in the chat in just a little bit, the Google doc and the evaluation link. Thanks Jessica, you can go forward. Um, Jeff, if you want, you guys let you walk through the agenda for today. Great. Um, so we are continuing on our, ex I guess I would say our exploration of um, um, sustainability with for children with uh, medical complexity and children and youth with special health care needs. And um, in keeping with the way in which we're trying to do this group, we're um, really trying to ask each of the teams to present at some point on where they're at. And we asked uh, North Carolina, as I'll say a little more in a minute, because they are um, a team that is um, like um, New Jersey, who was good enough to go first. And then um, the, um, um, the folks in, uh, in Ohio and in, um, the, uh, the North Carolina is um, trying to bring up their um, care coordination um, value-based payment in in light of a um, uh, in the in a managed care framework as well. Um, the other thing um, that we're so we're trying to do the echo with this all teach all learn. I'll remember that. So remember that. So I'm hoping we have a really good dialogue. We flipped it around today. Um, to help accommodate the schedule for the North Carolina folks, um, because um, Charlene is, um, I guess I would say, actively involved in helping with the uh, COVID vaccine distribution in North Carolina. And uh, we got trumped appropriately by that on this day when the first vaccines are being given in the country. So something to celebrate, but uh, something to accommodate the schedule. And then we'll go back today and um, hopefully have a little bit of fun around um, food and travel, and then we'll talk about Medicaid waivers um, just to get people on the same page as far as that's concerned. I hope that's a worthwhile agenda for everybody's next hour and a half. Um, Heather, we have anything else we need to do right now? Uh, no, I think you covered everything. Um, I think the next slide might get right into North Carolina. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Wong is available yet. I am here and ready to share my slides if I oh. have been given such power. <laughs> Alrighty. Awesome. Thank you, Charlene and David. Um, I um, want to um, just take one moment to um, thank these folks for uh, coming on with us. Um, um, I am, uh, am going to wing it because I can't find the thing, my little intro. So I apologize for that and just say that um, David is a, um, MedPeds hospitalist who's involved in the complex care program at Duke. Um, and Charlene is a pediatric adolescent uh, physician who is involved in, um, in that care as well as in involvement in um, the Margolis Center, um, which is the um, Health Policy Institute at Duke as well. And we're really excited to have them on. They are, and um, like New Jersey, they're one of the Inc. teams. And I also want to um, honor rec or I want to recognize that uh, we're delighted to have Ellen Marie Whalen join us to listen in today. She is the uh, um, um, is the um, direct. I mean, I get this title right either the director for um, um, healthcare innovation in uh, CMCS at Medicaid, as well as our colleagues from uh, um, HRSA Title V who are on with us. So, with that, Charlene, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you.
All right, I am hoping you guys are seeing my screen. Yep. All right, let me see if it can go into presenter mode here. Um, we appreciate the chance to present to you all today. I see lots of friends on the call. Hi, Ellen Marie, who um, we're very grateful of, with Ellen Marie's support that we have the opportunity to do this integrated care for kids model. Um, so we're gonna just, I'm just gonna dive on, right in. Um, here's our disclaimer, we are funded by CMS. We don't have any financial disclosures. We'd like to give you guys an overview of what we're doing in our ink, as I understand that this group has heard from other ink awardees. Um, and so we'd like to give you the flavor for what we're doing. Um, I will div dive a little bit into our proposed alternative payment models and measures. I will caveat right now, all of this is draft, so like lots of stuff still being decided. Um, David is going to present on some really innovative work that he's been leading around kids with medical complexity, which will ultimately end up tying in with ink. Um, and then uh, Jeff, Jeff and Rich really asked us to talk about our relationship with our own state Medicaid, which has been fantastic um, and I think has been a real key to us being able to move some of this forward. So the context for what's happening in North Carolina in Medicaid, because of course, Inc. is a Medicaid and we, are, we also included our CHIP program, is that we are in the midst of transforming to Medicaid managed care in North Carolina. We in North Carolina call our plans prepaid health plans, but they're essentially MP MCOs. Um, we have had a very delayed timeline on our launch, which has really influenced what we're doing in Inc. because, of course, we need to align with what's happening in the state. Um, we were supposed to already be in managed care once we were awarded with Inc., but um, that has been pushed back and we'll be launching next summer, um, which are going to be these five um, health insurance plans will be our MCOs. Fortunately for us, and I think was probably a very attractive part of our application, is that our Medicaid transformation in North Carolina at its core and, their, and the core values really aligned with so much of what we're trying to do for kids in Inc. And, and honestly, just for kids in general. Um, there is a, a huge focus and a very innovative approach to focusing on social determinants of health really statewide. Um, there was the opportunity to pilot test and innovate with part of our 1115 waiver. And then also this move opportunity for improved value with a move to value across the state. And it happens to also be across payers, not just Medicaid. Just in case anyone here hasn't, doesn't sort of know what ink is in general, this is the broad ink definition, um, which is a child-centered local service delivery and state payment model um, aimed at value, reducing expenditures, improving quality of care. It is for Medicaid and CHIP insured children, especially those with or at risk for developing significant health needs. Um, the CMS uh, goals for ink and, and for us as well are to improve priority outcomes of child health and well-being reduce avoidable inpatient stays and out-of-home placements, big emphasis on the out-of-home placements, and create sustainable alternative ways of paying for care. Of course, we know those are APMs. Um, what I'll be presenting up front is not gonna be highly focused on kids with medical complexity, and then David will pick that up at the end, just to let you all know, but if all these kids will be included in Inc. Oh, speaking of which, um, as you all likely know, this is a geographically defined model. So all Medicaid and CHIP insured children, we chose to go with five counties in central North Carolina, will be included in Inc. regardless of where they get care. Um, our lead entities in our model are Duke and UNC. Um, we don't have a large freestanding children's hospital in North Carolina. Duke and UNC are the two largest, uh, two of the largest academic medical centers caring for kids, particularly those who have medical complexity. And we estimate, actually, we just ran some data um, just this past week, it'll likely be closer to 100,000 kids with the bump from the pandemic. Um, and it is birth up to age 21 who will be attributed to the model. We did not choose to um, include pregnant women in our model, though some Inc. awardees um, did do so. We, we would have loved to, but there were reasons that it would have been really hard to do so. Um, we're all on the same timeline for Inc. We, we're in the middle of our two-year planning. I guess I really need to move this arrow back because we're almost to the end of 2020, and then we launch in um, 2022. Um, we are working across the same core child services that all the Inc. awardees are. Um, and so these include schools and early childhood, food, housing, physical and behavioral health care, our public ser health services, mobile crisis response, child welfare. And then we chose to add two optional services, which are juvie justice and legal aid as well, um, because we have really strong partners in North Carolina who wanted to work with us. And I mentioned the emphasis on reducing out-of-home placement. Obviously, juvie justice is, is an out-of-home placement um, setting, and so we wanted to focus on that. 
this is, I would say like the money slide. That's like, what, how do we plan to do this? Um, so there's three steps. The first in this purple box is we wanna more holistically assess the needs of kids. Um, going beyond just their medical needs using claims data. So we are um, right now in the process of talking with all of our data partners, getting all the DUAs in place to bring together health and social data along with guardian data. And um, this is where our relationship with Medicaid and all our broader Department of Health and Human Services has been really critical because all of these linkages are happening at the state within North Carolina state government. It is not happening at Duke. Um, then using those data, we're coming up with a child specific algorithm to assign a need level called a service integration level or SIL, which can be updated over time. That's the first step. Second step in the blue box is based on the kids we've identified with higher needs using this more holistic data, we will coordinate services for kids um, that have those higher needs and we think we'll pick up kids that wouldn't otherwise have been picked up. Um, and so that's doing things like making sure that we've identified a single point of contact for them, who's the quarterback for that child developing a cross-sector shared action plan, borrowing a lot from what Rich has developed in his own work, um, and then also working with our local partners as we've been refining that um, to make sure that we're building something that can work for them. An important part of that is we have a new um, resource te uh, technology resource platform in North Carolina called NC Care 360, and the innovation that we're really hoping to bring from Inc. is that we will have this um, document and it will be available in, in a place where not just the one person who has the document has access to it, but it'll actually be available, of course, with consent and appropriate you know, security sign-in for other folks on the care team to be able to see that so they can see what common goals are in progress towards those goals. Um, one of the key personnel in the um, all ink models are someone called the service integration, um, or we call them the service integration consultant. We're thinking about maybe rebranding it, but it's basically folks we are hiring with our dollars to facilitate the cross-sector coordination. Of course, we already have care managers in all these different sectors, social workers, and we're really, we're trying to build those bridges. And the way we've chosen to hire these folks, which is different than a lot of awardees, is we're not hiring them all at Duke or UNC or our MCOs. We're hiring them in our partner sector. So for example, we just hired our first full-time person outside of Duke or UNC in um, one of our local Head Starts. Um, we're hiring a social worker from juvenile justice um, to, to serve as one of these service integration consultants because then they bring with them the lived experience and also living in the infrastructure of a core child service area where we want to build those bridges. And then finally, we'll design our APMs. Um, we will match the services to the tier level of risk that we've identified using our ho more holistic data. So for example, that shared action plan I mentioned that will be posted where a lot of people can access it. We're, we're only going to do that for our very highest risk kids. And so we're in the process right now of figuring out and what's going to be our algorithm for getting to this. Um, this is a very rough draft um, of what we're thinking about for assigning um, that level. Um, and so you can see we're really trying to capture across both physical and behavioral health risks and social determinants risks, educational um, metrics that we have, guardian risk, and risk of out-of-home placement. Um, lots of work happening on this now is even getting all the data together as you all I'm sure can understand to even run the numbers to see where we're at as we think about these different thresholds um, is something we're working through now and we're getting great um, assistance, technical assistance from CMS um, and their partners on this. And so just to bring it back to a child, um, we hope that we would have a kid like Jonathan who you know, perhaps comes to see me or David in clinic in underweight for age, maybe missed his five-year-old well child check. That's sort of like what we would, you know, at a very high systems level, we would like to sort of know that. What we wouldn't always know is that he doesn't always get breakfast. He missed three weeks of school last year. Parent needs substance abuse treatment. Family lacks reliable transportation. With INC, we would hope that we would actually know that in that holistic screening about the social and parental needs and that he would be assigned to a higher needs level because, of course, with this, he'd probably just go into like the lowest tier. Um, his pediatrician would have access to that platform I mentioned so that they would know who is that person, who is that family's quarterback, that single point of contact. Um, let me check out his shared action plan. And then we'd have APMs that match that. I'm going to roll on to the APMs and I think we're going to be available for questions after this, um, but feel free to start putting them into the chat and I can respond as David is presenting his section. Um, our vision for our INC APMs are to enable providers to deliver fundamentally different and more integrated care that better meets children's physical, mental, and social needs. And we're also intending that they can enhance and support 
the efforts of what we're already doing, right? It's not, it's not, we, are, we would love for there to be some new parts, but I think a lot of us already try to do some of these things. It's just really hard and it's not recognized. Because there's a lot of moving parts in North Carolina, we're really emphasizing with our partners who are in this very complex ecosystem, the fact that we are focused on kids and that we are focused on cross-sector integration capacity and infrastructure. This has been our design process and we spent the, well, we spent the first six months trying to like get started in the midst of COVID. Um, and then we started socializing with our partners and what we're doing now is we're co-designing with our stakeholders. So we have a working group, an APM working group specifically that meets every month that is um, attended by a, the most senior Medicaid leadership who is in charge of the value-based care strategy for all of North Carolina. Um, our three major clinically integrated networks that have kids that will be in Inc. We have senior leadership from all of the new man managed care organizations. Usually it's their CMO and or director of population health and or CFO or another C something or director of something um, in that space, um, as well as our Inc. leadership. We also have a family council um, who continues to provide input on everything that we're doing in the model, as well as a youth council of teenagers and young adults. And then we are very um, cognizant of the timeline that we're working on because we know that these things take time. Here is um, our proposed approach right now again. And I, I put on here, please don't distribute these publicly. These are really like very draft right now. And this is very likely to change. So I wanted to share with this group. Um, so we are in our planning period, as I mentioned, we are um, proposing something that looks like a glide path to value because our managed care plans don't even launch until halfway through next year. Their requirements for value-based care are still being set, but likely will be after when we need to launch our APMs. We also, they will be building all the pipes and the plumbing that are required to do things like the performance measures, not just for us, but just for managed care, generally creating those um, pipes with the providers. Um, and so we're proposing to do something like a transition pay for reporting with some pay for performance, moving towards a higher level APM as the data infrastructure is built for practice management. You all have likely seen this before. This, these are the um, CMS required measures for the all integrated care for kids models. The top half are a bunch of the standard HEDIS measures, which we all know the ones we're very excited about are the cross sector well being measures like kindergarten readiness, chronic absence from school, food and housing instability. The ones with the little pink stars are the ones that are priority measures for us given to us from CMS. And then we were very fortunate, again, this I think speaks to um, Jeff and Rich, one of your questions, which is uh, tell us about your relationship with Medicaid. So um, because it's so wonderful uh, be and because we had a delay in the launch of our Medicaid managed care, originally all these little SPTPs, these are our managed care plans that are rolling out. Originally our measures did not align um, with what they were planning to use as their measures. Um, in, in managed care. Um, because they were delayed, they actually changed their measures that now all of those MCOs will be required to report to align with the ones that we are required to report. Um, we are also meeting actually just this week with another one of the major private payers in the state um, that um, is also moving towards value because we're trying to get multi-payer alignment on some of these measures. Again, not that we've achieved it yet, but we are, we're trying to start very early um, so that even if it doesn't happen right off the bat, we can move towards that because of course, though, all of us who see patients, it's not like we see patients with one insurance, you know, in one session and then we switch the next session to only see patients with this type of insurance. And particularly if we're talking about things like kindergarten readiness and chronic absence in school, which are really different than what we usually do, the more um, overall alignment we're able to get on that, the better. Um, these, we are very fortunate in North Carolina that um, every Medicaid beneficiary across the state will be screened for, um, we call them healthy opportunities, um, they're you know, social drivers of health. So for food and housing and security, these are the sets of questions that will be asked of all Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and so we're, we're fortunate to be able to use that. And the MCOs are um, responsible for asking these questions. There will be partnership with providers almost for sure to help um, fill the gaps for where they don't get responses. Okay, this is also very draft everyone. So caveat, 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 but I wanted to show it to you all because I think I thought it would be of interest to you all. This is where we're at in our conversations and we just met last week with our working group around selecting performance measures. And this is for sure gonna change, no question that this will change, um, but this is sort of where we are. When selecting performance measures, the approach we took was we want our payment model to match our care delivery model, right? It's not, not the other way around. Like the care delivery model is, is sort of the first thing to develop and then you match your payment model with that. For us, as I mentioned, our care delivery model 
focuses on cross-sector integration, and hence we want our payment model to also emphasize cross-sector integration of services. And so we chose to go with, for now, um, the measures that really emphasize that. So kindergarten readiness, food insecurity, housing instability. What we're hearing from our partners, um, both the payers and the providers is, wow, kindergarten readiness, that seems great. How, what are we supposed to do about that from the providers? Um, can we come up with some proxies for what it is that we might be able to do and cr get credit for in trying to move the needle on that? Because obviously that's a hard needle to move. So we've been looking at things like, the, you know, getting the right developmental screens. We feel like that's like, okay, where we really like to get is to more um, increased enrollment in pre-K and getting more of those spots available over time. Um, but a lot of work happening there. Um, for food insecurity, it was the same sort of thing. Don't ask us to just screen for this, especially because our metric is to move the needle and reduce food insecurity. What are some of the proxies, um, the intervention proxies that we might be able to capture so that we can really try to recognize people um, in the healthcare system and beyond for doing this really hard work that it takes to move the needle here. Um, we have an emphasis on uh, behavioral health, so screening for clinical depression and follow-up plan. This is a hybrid measure, so this for North Carolina also is a little bit new um, as we're working towards across the state. And again, this is one where Medicaid aligned with us to also require the hybrid measures ac across the board. Um, so we'll be looking at that. Um, and then we need, do need to choose, we, we, or we would like to choose one measure at least that is more directly targeting cost savings because we are a value-based care model. There will be a total cost of care measure as a requirement in the APM. Um, and so we are talking about various measures of ED utilization, follow-up after mental health hospitalization. And then what these phases really show is a transition of awareness to pay for reporting, to pay for performance, to some sort of shared savings, shared loss model as the ultimate higher level APM. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work right now to gather more information on what's going on currently in North Carolina in kindergarten readiness, like what are clinicians in off pediatric and family med offices already doing. Um, we're researching pre-K enrollment processes and eligibility in North Carolina in our districts. We're trying to map what additional tools and supports there are for our CMCers or youth and ch children and youth with special needs. Um, and so I will uh, turn it back over to David to talk about um, CMCs. Charlene, do you want me to take over share screen so then you can respond that would to be questions? Awesome. Yes. Okay. Someone empower me with that. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Great. Can everyone see these slides? Awesome. Yep. Yes. Um, so, you know, honored to be here, kind of really happy to be part of the discussion and looking forward to, to, to learning from the group today. Um, as Jeff mentioned, my name is David Ming. I'm a Medicine and Pete's Hospitals here at Duke. We're closely with Charlene on a number of our inter, uh, interwoven projects. And I'll spend just a few minutes talking about some of our work for children with medical complexity, although I would also kind of broaden the term and think about, uh, kind of say up front that I think about complexity in pretty broad sense. Um, and maybe I'll shed some light on what I mean by that. Um, this figure, which is uh, really difficult to digest all the, uh, all the little, uh, uh, little widgets, is by definition kind of messy. And I think it's meant to kind of uh, uh, share kind of the typical timeline and experience that happens for, for typical children and families with medical complexity over the course of a year. You may have a number of different clinic visits, uh, planned or unplanned visits, the hospital planned or unplanned surgeries. Um, and typically, at least in, in my experience in our health system and, and many others, we tend to be very reactive to these major events and episodes. And those care coordination event, uh, efforts that follow these major episodes uh, and encounters with the health system uh, tend to be very siloed. So uh, a great example is trans intensive transitions of care for the first 30 days, and then, you know, back to kind of whatever usual care is. Um, but the question marks represent what I always kind of think of as the interstitial space. This is the time between visits, between contexts, which actually represent the vast majority of days in any child's life. Um, they're not in the healthcare system. They are at home in their communities. And that's where the work falls on the shoulders of families. And I think everyone in this group understands and probably gets that in a very deep way. Um, and, you know, our objective when it comes to thinking about this is if we can somehow try to shore up and provide more support in a shared collaborative manner for that interstitial space, starting um, between inclusive of, to, between visits, then we have a better shot at going from care fragmentation to you know, care integration, which is really across sites, across time, across systems, across providers. Um, the second just level setting principle is that I think some of the things I'll be talking about in some of our work with 
Um, our learning health unit focused on you know, data-driven approaches to care for complex patients um, is, uh, you know, is a lot of these principles are not you know, new things that we haven't known about. I mean, many of these people on this call, as I'm seeing, I mean, you all really have been the pioneers of establishing this body of research on core foundational terms like the patient-centered medical home, care coordination principles, care integration. <clears throat> now we talk about population health and cross-sector integration, as Charlene just mentioned. Um, but there, there is a reason just that, you know, why we're still talking about this, and we'll probably continue to talk about this because of this kind of implementation gap. It's not that we don't know that these types of approaches make sense for children with complex needs and their families, but there is that gap and, you know, the classic sort of seven tier year odyssey between, um, you know, a research trial and actually diffused, sustained, widely disseminated uh, practice and implementation. So that's part of the spirit of some of the work that um, I'll be describing today is also focused on is trying to think about the implementation gap starting within our site. Um, what I'm talking about today is a focused effort um, uh, within our health system uh, supported through a mechanism internally called the Learning Health Units or LHUs, which is um, uh, a shared kind of investment from the health system and the School of Medicine to focus on um, applying learning health principles to groups of patients, including pediatrics, which we're thrilled to be part of the pilot group with this initiative. And I think while Charlene just kind of described a lot of, you know, the broad landscape inclusive of all children in this large area thinking about big picture and policy, I think some of the things I'll be talking about. Are you crying? Um, I think one of the things I'll be talking about is uh, talking narrowing down to a, a more kind of contained, smaller environment where we'll be maybe testing a number of, of different uh, point of care, direct care delivery and care management interventions um, in hopefully what's a rapid cycle learning type approach. Um, really, when I think about our entire effort here, we really are thinking about three streams of work that we're trying to bring together within this pilot learning health focused um, uh, demonstration project. So, you know, we, you know, we center ourselves in the clinical space. Uh, this is kind of amplified by some of our clinical partners here within our institution, but also trying to bring to bear uh, big data and data science through an initiative called AI Health, which is an institutional wide uh, group here at Duke. And can we marry that big data and those data insights and bring, make that data actionable at the point of care and in the real world environment? And then kind of another aspirational reach we have here is trying to also incorporate uh, user human-centered design principles, which is some partnerships through the university and some our peer institution, NC State, that we've partnered with to develop some of this work. Um, but the whole thing really is a, you know, a big PDSA cycle in the classic QI approach with a lot of time and effort that I'll be describing today talking about our planning phases um, to prepare us for our launch of our whole model next month. Um, we call this, we kind of labeled this project our Pediatric Complex Care Integration or PCCI clinical program that we're piloting in our health system at a pilot site. And this is the pipeline um, of what we think about. We start with, we're working within EHR data and are working with our data science team to identify, to start with all children um, who, have, uh, who have primary care in, the, in a certain age range and are attributed to our, our health system. Um, looking within that piloted attributed primary care site to then risk stratify based on uh, a number of different features that we have uh, kind of culled together through uh, the months um, across three broad domains of past patterns of healthcare use in and outside of the hospital, um, clinical conditions, and as well socio-demographic and socioeconomic factors that we can access through the EHR. And we've built a data predictive data model to help us risk stratify down from all kids to complex kids at the pilot clinic site to those who are risk stratified as high risk. Um, and we go from a very large group of patients down to a smaller group of patients that's relevant to our, our clinicians at our private, at our, our pilot site, um, and then prioritize those. Um, and I think the prioritization within this LHU construct, um, we have gone back and forth uh, about thinking about how to do that because, um, you know, one of the challenges is trying to develop this sort of a, a, a program with in sort of a, in a FTE neutral manner and really uh, leveraging existing staff and recognizing that in that type of environment, you will always have more kids who are high risk could benefit from more support than your existing staff can manage. And so what we have done is kind of tried to figure out first, what is the capacity for our staff to be able to support enhanced care through this model for high risk complex patients at this pilot site 
um, and then randomly prioritize patients within that larger bucket of high-risk patients who will then be allocated to our care managers who then provide the proactive care coordination and outreach within this program. In this pilot model, we're planning to, to outreach to about 100 patients. This is layered on top of existing clinical operations and building in steps to incorporate all of this into usual EHR documentation processes in EPIC, which is our EHR. Um, so as I mentioned from the outset, I, I personally don't believe that the notion of care coordination or care management are novel concepts. But what I've highlighted here is that I think a lot of the core components and the critical features of this PCCI program, which is trying to implement them and put them to, put them to bring them to bear in a stand, consistent manner in a real world, world environment is still something that, you know, certainly in our health system is not standardized and nor is completely consistent. So to me, it still represents uh, an opportunity for innovation, particularly thinking about the implementation and learning health principles we can bring to bear in the real world environment. So we are delivering standardized care coordination. I think importantly, um, the actual uh, you know, engines of this type of a care model for these high risk patients we identify through our predictive data model really involve collaboration between existing in clinic and central care management staff. And so what I mean by central is that our health system, we have our own um, Duke health system population health care management office that involves an array of everyone from care managers to coordinators to community health workers, et cetera. And they are responsible not only for um, now more children, but uh, you know, tens of thousands of adult lives in, uh, for example, Medicaid shared savings, other ACO type uh, arrangements. Um, but what we've observed over time is a lot of those care coordination efforts in the community by that organization centrally may, is very siloed from what people at the front lines, I'm thinking the nurse clinician in clinic X or the social worker in clinic B are doing. And it's very possible that within our own health system, we may have people who are care managing and providing support to the same patients without even having any recognition of that. And so the goal here is to try to break down that silo, reorient the existing staff around a shared panel of patients. So, you know, whether you call that collaboration or care redesign or clinical workflow redesigns, I think they're all in kind of a similar spirit. A lot of the things on the right hand here is what I think of as core components of this uh, care, care program that I'm describing. Um, and all of these things, I would say that today, we are not universally delivering for all of our complex uh, children across our entire health system. So they all represent opportunities for us to embed uh, many evidence-based things, shared plans of care, social, universal social needs screening, shared decision-making principles, and developing new EHR tools that will allow those existing in-clinic and central staff to have transparency and visibility about their shared panel of patients. Um, this is a, it came out kind of blurry, but um, this is some preliminary data. So just like Shirley mentioned, a lot of the content I'm talking about is also quite dynamic. We're preparing, frantically preparing for launch next month and putting in the final pieces. But as in our most latest simulations, looking at our EH, retrospective historical data in the EHR starting in January 2016 through now, from which our data model has been testing and learning um, to kind of identify high risk versus lower risk patients for the outcome of predicting patient children who are gonna be at, at risk for a hospitalization in the next six months. Um, we've been pretty pleased in general with the potential for it to identify uh, you know, high risk patients as demonstrated by this ROC curve, curve across this age range from zero up to 20 years old. In terms of primary outcomes, uh, you know, they're the usual things that we are anticipating to look at for patients who do receive this, this care model within our pilot site and utilization cost and quality measures, all of which are relevant, um, just as I think Charlene just highlighted uh, to payers, but also to our health systems. Um, but I think actually one of the richer learnings we hope to partner with that are a lot of secondary outcomes based on you know, family and parent reported experiences uh, using a number of validated instruments from like the PICS, from Rich's work, um, to principles of activated self-management um, related to kind of self-efficacy and parental activation, um, as well as thinking about how this type of a care model that uh, provides targeted risk stratified uh, enhanced support to high-risk patients uh, can hopefully improve uh, the experience for our staff in terms of their own well-being, because we know that caring for complex patients with not the right allocation of resources can be very stressful. 
Um, and I'll just kind of end here with, you know, a, a, an analogy that this kind of drives what we've, how we've been thinking about these things. I think there is kind of this, this often this tension between personalization and standardization. And, and this is an example from our local bookshop here in Durham and then Amazon, obviously. Um, and in clinical medicine, when I think about the care of uh, children with complex or special needs, then we think about this direct, very personal bedside experience. Uh, but then at the payer largest levels, people need to be able to scale and reach a lot of patients who have a lot of needs. Um, I think the analog is what I was describing before, are in-clinic teams caring for many special needs and complex paid children and our central population health management organization may actually be care managing patients, maybe even the same patients without really realizing what one another are doing. So the central thrust of this is to bring some of that together and, and, and break down those silos. And, you know, our central, you know, I guess our wicked problem, if you will, is, is can we do apply this sort of data driven um, approach using EHR data, make do it in a way where the care model and the data model is replicable, but still not may lose this human centeredness and pragmatic nature that our clinicians and our families demand and still preserves longitudinal family centeredness. Um, and the last slide here, I'll just talk about some of the tools we've taken to try to embed and really, um, we've really leaned pretty hard in trying to bake in the human centeredness uh, through some of our stakeholder engagement and under exploring the implementation context uh, to prepare for this program. So for example, we've gone through a series of uh, kind of formal human-centered design processes to help engage our users from a, a variety of different domains to understand um, uh, the, the environment. And then we've also used other uh, techniques from the research world like rapid qualitative uh, analyses, as well as um, a, a specific type of a focus group methodology called communication, community consultation studios um, with a panel of family stakeholders uh, in a formal manner that we'll continue to do uh, throughout the lifespan of the rollout of the project to keep ourselves accountable to what's happening uh, once this project goes live. And the hope is that what I just presented from these approaches to stakeholder engagement to the principles of collaboration between in-clinic and central staff to type looking at outcomes and leverage and having it all be driven in a data-driven manner uh, can be replicated to support other clinics that also are in our network and caring for complex children with uh, complex health needs. So here, I, I think I'll turn it back over to, to Charlene. Great. Um, David, do you mind if we just keep the slides up yes, on your no problem. That would be awesome. All right. So, um, you know, this is just the only slide I have on our relationship with our state Medicaid program. And I think this has been um, beneficial for us and Inc., certainly for the work that David is leading as well, because again, Medicaid transformation is, those of you who have been through a Medicaid transformation in your own state know is like massive um, and really will influence, you know, so much of what it means to provide care to children um, with complexity or without. Um, and so our, we have really taken a team-based approach to um, building bridges between our key organizations. So as I mentioned, Duke and UNC, which are our two largest academic medical centers that serve kids, particularly those with medical complexity. Um, I'm the executive director, Mike, who is also a pediatrician at UNC, their pediatrician in chief is our health director. Um, Kelly Crosby is from North Carolina Medicaid. She is the Director of Population Health and Quality at Medicaid, and she is our policy director. So we have, oh, I don't know, five, six calls with, with Kelly and her team um, every week. Um, and so we're in very close communication. And then we have really a COO, essentially, Sarah Allen, um, who lives at Duke. We also have a partnership council, which all of the ink awardees have, which has representatives from all of our um, core child services. And we made the very intentional choice to have co-chairs, one um, being someone who represents one of our core child services that is not healthcare. And so for us, it is this man named Tony Cozart who has spent his career um, really in the early care and education space in North Carolina. And then Jamila Freeman um, is the co-chair of our family council. Um, and she is a mom who has, um, actually does have a child with special, with a medical complexity um, who is covered, insured by Medicaid. And she herself happens to be a licensed clinical mental health counselor and um, works with us very closely on so many aspects of our model. But I would say sort of the approach we've taken to our partnership with Medicaid is one that is very close and very aligned. Um, we are also trying to stick with simplicity where we can in our model because we recognize the ecosystem on which we're building the ink model is very complex. And so really trying to be very focused and aligned and keep it simple. 
And I think Jeff and Rich, we went a little probably over our time that we were supposed to, but um, if y'all want to follow us, our Twitter account recently launched. We have a website that launched. Um, please follow us. <laughs> wow. Charlene and David, this is wonderful to hear all this stuff. And um, I think, um, I think I want to, if you, I know Charlene, you're okay till the top of the hour. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, I guess, I think we could put questions in three categories and the category that's in the chat is really sort of about the service models. So I want to honor those. And I know Charlene, you answered um, Rahel's, but I wonder if you want to talk about um, the um, sort of the, I used to call it the one, one hub on a wheel. You can only have one hub on a wheel. You only can have one quarterback. So um, these, how, if somebody um, is in a service integration level that they, um, that they have a plan, their, their quarterback depends on, it just depend on where they are or what their issue is? That's something we're designing right now and talking with a lot of partners around how is it we identify that quarterback or the single point of contact. Um, we imagine, again, we're trying to align and as part of Medicaid managed care transformation, um, the managed care plans will be required to, to do care management for kids who are um, tiered into a certain level of risk. So we're trying to build upon that. We also though wanna recognize that for some of the children in our model, that care manager may not be the, the best, may, may, not, may not be the best person to serve in that quarterback role. So for example, um, and, and they might not have one. So like, for example, our kids who are in foster care will be carved out of the initial transition to Medicaid managed care. And so a child, for example, who is actively um, receiving a, a DSS or child welfare services, thinking about if their social worker um, would be the person who's best positioned to do that. Um, you know, we're thinking really creatively this, that we might not be able to get this off, um, to get this implemented right off the ground. But, you know, if it's a kid's guidance counselor that they're very close with at school, you know, and that's a person we, we would love to develop this in a way that it is truly the person who is best positioned to do that cross sector coordination for a child. And that does not necessarily mean they need to be on our healthcare system. And we imagine for many kids, they won't be in our healthcare system. We are also trying to be practical um, and acknowledging that this is a model that is, it is by Medicaid. And so um, we are, we're doing a lot of sort of minimal viable product or like version ones of things as we're developing parts of the model, knowing that they're going to be stepping stones towards like our version two and three as we um, are able to build more. But that's what we're thinking about um, and recognizing. And I, I am still also a practicing primary care pediatrician. There is like, well, there's not very much more you can ask us to like build into, you know, our short time that we have um, with patients, particularly those of those who are uh, have any sort of medical or social or familial complexity. Yeah, so um, I want to just, I want to add, have you talked about, because this is, the people are adding to the chat, which is great. So um, we'll get to that. Charlene, I just want to ask you, since there's, potential quarterbacks in different places. Um, um, have you talked about how the funds flow to those folks to give them time to do that? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it, Jeff, and if anyone has examples of how they've achieved doing that in your own, in your own setting, please let us know. Um, we are a setting that um, we don't have really any value-based care in our Medicaid program right now. We're in a traditional Medicaid program. So again, we're trying to be a little bit practical in the sense that the move to any value is, is like a big move. <laughs> um, yeah. And then as we're talking about, I mean, we have talked about, because other Inc. awardees are talking about, you know, how might you share savings um, with some of these other partners. It's something we're very interested in. Again, I don't know if it's something we're going to be able to launch right off the bat. Um, there are limited dollars for that, you know, for all of this as always. Um, of course, we are really advocating for more dollars going to kids in general, but, you know, working within the confines of what, what we have available to us because we're not allowed to spend our ink dollars on any direct care service provision. So um, we're really using the managed care contracting mechanism to be able to, pull up, to put a lot of this in place. 
Um, and yeah. just a quick answer to Joan for child welfare. That was not a decision we made. Um, met, uh, the Medicaid program um, is, is doing that. They, they will get rolled in to manage care. It's just they're trying to do it again in a little bit of a staged fashion since all of these are really major transformations. Great. Do you want to answer Steve's question about um, what kind of tools for care management and are they embedded in the EMR? Yes. So the, one of the major tools that we hope to really provide is that um, a, the, uh, a consultation and facilitating that shared action plan because um, our service integration consultants were hiring 13 to 15 full or part time folks. Um, again, which is like not that many, so they are not going to have like caseloads the way a, ca a care you know, manager or a case manager would have, but they would be available to help um, the folks who are doing that shared action plan to fill that out. Um, also, we are developing a whole cadre of tool of educational materials um, around what happens in other core child services, because at least I, I mean, I'll just speak from my own perspective. You know, before I started this work, juvie justice was like a little bit of a black box to me. Like I just, I didn't really understand what happens there, who makes the decisions for a child, you know, how that's structured. And so part of also what we're trying to develop and not that education is not going to get us all the way there, but it'll probably help us, you know, get there so that at least people have some base level of understanding and we have personnel embedded within these organizations and at our governance level in the partnership council, we have leadership from those organizations. All, we're all working together. So we've identified common goals. We have built trust. We have built relationships so that we will be able to facilitate more of this cross-sector care coordination. Um, the EMR piece, we're actually, because we're trying to move the locus of control and focus outside of healthcare when possible. I mentioned we have this platform in North Carolina called NC Care 360, which is this resource platform where a big one thing you guys may have heard of is we're going to be doing closed loop referrals for social drivers of health services on that. So for example, kid comes to see David in clinic, recognizes that they are food insecure. David will click on a little button in our Duke EHR that will bring him to the NC Care 360 portal or his social worker will in clinic that says, this family is, um, is having food insecurity right now. How acute is it? That gets e-referred out into the, into the platform. Then the food service providers who are also onboarded on this platform then grab that referral document that they provided services and that gets closed loop back and then in certain areas of our state under our 1115 way where public medicaid dollars will be used to pay for that food we are actually we actually ended up rolling this out faster across the state than we expected because of covid because we're at the state also providing um, what we're calling isolation and quarantine supports to people during the pandemic and those are being provided via this nc care 360 platform so it's already live in all 100 counties in north carolina um, so that's sort of what we're planning now. And we're, again, we're, try, we're planning on NC Care 360 to use that as the platform where we're posting some of these key things like shared action plans, who's the care team, because, you know, if it's in our EMR, that's fantastic for people who are able to get into our EMR, but we know it is super hard to get people who are not in your own health system to have any sort of access into your EMR. And so we're really looking to use this platform that is our, that has been built and is meant to build these connections across um, service providers in North Carolina, particularly for vulnerable populations. Wow. I think if you want to look at Rich's, he was asking about um, how often do families consider themselves as the quarterback in the team to build their care integration? Yeah, and we've been working a lot with our family council uh, on these questions. And it, it happens to be that our family council is mostly made up of parents who happen to have children with medical complexity. Um, and so, yes, I think they often consider, consider themselves a quarterback. It was also very interesting, like a piece of feedback they gave us recently is, as we talked about, like this thing that we're very excited about, right? Shared action plan going up on this platform so that various team members can see it they really raise some caution around, sometimes they don't want certain team members to know certain things about their child for whom maybe they don't need to know that, you know, like their school counselor or, you know, a, a, a first grade teacher, you know, to know about that and, and the consent processes that we're gonna need to put in place and how families are already super overburdened with consent for this, consent for that. And you just feel like you're like selling your kids information to like anyone and everyone. So um, again, not that we figured all of that out, but it's, it's, it's feedback that we're listening to all the time. We have family members on all of our, uh, many of our core working groups, particularly those that are like this, that are very sort of family 
facing and we want to make sure that they're at the table um, with us every step of the way, not just in like a meeting once a quarter or something. Do they have access to the North Carolina Care 360? Do the family members have access? They will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it, got it. I want to, um, Charlie, I'm curious about, there's a lot of things that you guys talked about from DUAs to share information to the that platform, the NCA, you know, to these levels of service. Um, a lot of states are, are trying to figure out where to get the toehold to move forward. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the relationship of your relationships with Medicaid to the development of these program, to the development of these steps? Did the data system come first? Did the, you know, how did, how did this, because it, you know, all of this is real, is cool to see, but it's sort of a, it's been built incrementally, undoubtedly. So I'm curious about what advice you'd have for states that are trying to you know, to move forward in um, in this step. Do you go after the data first? Do you go after the relationships? Do you go after? Do you do incrementally all those steps at the same time? So maybe you're building a stool that gets higher. I don't know what the metaphor. Yeah. Is. I think maybe I'll say a couple of things to that. I think. Number one, we are extremely grateful to CMS, and I'm not just saying that because Ellen Marie is on, but we are like really grateful to CMS for having the opportunity to do this. I mean, it really, it took having the funding to really, you know, get a team that is dedicated to building this, obviously to be able to sort of move. I mean, it feels, some of, it feels like some of the things we're moving feel like mountains. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, to sort of have this funding, the mandate, the authority, you know, to do that, I think is number one. The second is, as we started this, I mean, this started as a partnership. It wasn't like, you know, Duke had written a whole application and then at the last minute we went to our Department of Health and Human Services to say, hey, can you support us? Um, the, actually, the excitement for doing this came all the way from our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mandy Cohen, who said this aligns with our priorities in the state. There was a, we had a big focus on uh, young kids, moving to value, opioids and behavioral health. And so it was really at her, um, with her support that we went after this in, in the first place. And she recommended that Duke and UNC come together. And so I would say from the very beginning, the entire conceptualization of the model happened in partnership. Um, I would actually say it was myself and a counterpart at Medicaid um, who were really the lead lead leads on, on sort of writing and, and developing and designing the whole thing. And we brought the coalition together sort of very early on. And I would say, um, I think Jack, to your question, we've been doing it all at the same time. We have, um, we have created a structure, um, a, an organizational structure, such that we have folks who are working on more of the care integration model. We have folks who are working on the data pieces and the policy pieces. Um, and then we meet, those two teams meet together every week to make sure that we sort of have those right bridges. And then those of us who are at the leadership level also you know, serve as the connections between those. Um, so I would say all of it, right. at, all the time. <laughs> it seems like the cadence is pretty fast if you're meeting weekly. It's, oh yes, I mean it's, um, it's yeah, it's very fast. It's an, an, it's an immense amount of effort uh, and commitment of time on, on everyone's parts. Um, we've also been very fortunate in our partnership council that I mean, it's not been hard to get people to be excited about what we're building and people are volunteering a lot of time um, to help us <laughs> with pieces of this. I will also say we have been tried to, we've tried to be very attuned to um, the, you know, changing landscape around us, the pandemic, um, a, a real focus on equity. We're, I should have mentioned in our APM, our last working group meeting was really focused on how do we truly build equity into our model and as an opportunity to, to really do something quite uh, novel there. And for example, linking payment towards closing a gap um, in disparity as opposed to not just on average, how much did you move the needle on a measure? Um, so we are looking at some baseline data there um, to potentially link to. So I don't know, I feel like that was a little bit, a lot of different things, but. No, I think it's fascinating. I wanna make sure that everybody else or other folks, if they have questions, have time. I've been, what I've been um, I'm gonna just say, please open your mics if you have anything else you wanna add or else. Uh, we can keep going, but I'd like to hear what other folks have to say. So Charlene, this is Renee Henderson. 
Did you get other payers involved other than Medicaid? And how did you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, we're lucky in North Carolina that we don't have like an, a, a huge number of payers. Like I was just, we just met with our New York Inc. counterparts recently where they have like 15 MCOs. And I mean, it's like, it was like a lot of payers to handle. We have really one major private payer that we, if between that private payer and Medicaid, it is the vast, vast majority of kids that are served by like our health, the healthcare providers in our region. Um, we just happen to have very good relationships with them. It's in part, I think Jeff or Rich mentioned, like I'm part of this health policy shop at Duke and we work very closely with both of those given that, you know, with the state as well as this major private payer, it's a Blue Cross plan. Um, and so we've sort of been working with them all along. It also happened to be that the CEO at the time that we were putting this application in and until recently was Patrick Conway, who was of course a huge champion for children as a pediatrician himself who used to run CMMI. And so he actually was advising us um, on the APMs that we were proposing and, and thinking about performance measures. So I think, again, so much of this, I think, comes down to relationships and trust. Um, and, and we're really trying to leverage where we already have some of that and, and build quite a bit more um, in this work. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Can I, Sorry. Um, Can I ask a question, Jeff? This is Steve. Sure, absolutely. When you're doing the risk stratification and trying to identify the higher risk um, children with medical complexity, I'm wondering, are you going to try to do something you design yourself? Or are you going to try to build on algorithms that exist? Um, I just was curious how you're going to go about that. Uh, we'd like to do a mix of both. Um, so for example, and this is building really off of David's work um, that he's been doing with um, a lot of risk stratification in the model he was describing, um, we would like to use existing alg algorithms like PMCA as one of the components. And um, because we're going to link all these data together that at least North Carolina have never been linked together before to know things like kindergarten readiness, chronic absence from school. We have um, our state already has some of this familial linkage uh, created uh, incarceration, juvie justice data. Of course, we need to get all these DUAs in place and such, um, but we would like to build a model that incorporates those elements as well so that we have that more holistic sense of what a child's risks and needs are. Um, the first time we do it, it'll be like a blunt that, that'll be like, again, like our minimal viable product or version one. And then we will hopefully learn over time which of those are actually predictive of things like out of home placement with the, in these linked data. And then we'll refine that over time. And again, we're really um, looking to build a lot off of what David has described. I am so sorry, I'm gonna have to hop off, but I would be very happy to take additional um, questions. Um, adolescents to young adulthood as an adolescent doc, I will say it's something that we're very interested in. Um, we haven't sort of designed anything specifically around that at this point, but at, that, at this point, but we do go up to age 21. Charlene, thank you. That was absolutely breathtaking. Thank you for your leadership and your participation in the Academy. We appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. David, are you still here for another couple minutes or are you out? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can stick around. I wanted to, um, um, well, I want to thank both of you for being on. I wanted to ask you if um, the relationship of your um, um, program with, for complex kids, are you, you, are you, is the risk stratification being designed by, um, are your, is yours the same one that the state's using? Or is it, are you doing something that's, that has more EHR data or other things in it? A little bit more the latter, to be honest, uh, Jeff. We are using uh, EHR data. And so, um, so we, we do have uh, elements that are gonna be aligned with like Charlene's work, you know, uh, with tools like PMCA um, within our model, but there are also a number of other features that we look at within the EHR, within the model I was alluding to, um, that we use for risk stratification for our pilot. And it's all a little bit messier too, because it's, it's EHR data. Yep. And is your, are you funding your program through Duke or is it funded through Inc or is it funded through a different mechanism? We're funding through some internal uh, seed money. Okay. Um, 
Marcia was asking about, and I'm not sure if you know this or not, but we can, um, if there's a consent process for the parents with the NC360, or can they, can yeah. they have I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to defer. We can loop back. I can, I can loop that up to, to Charlene and maybe she can respond. Man. I am, uh, um, this is a really helpful conversation. I just want to ask if anybody else has other comments or questions before we close out this part of our SAG for the day. It, Jeff, if I can just follow up. Um, you know, one of the aspects of the PMCA model that I found challenging as it relates to identifying a pop uh, individuals as opposed to a risk on a population is that it's built on a population based risk model. And so it's likely to not be um, all that accurate at the individual level. And I assume you're aware of that. I just wanted to know how you're going to kind of accommodate or adjust for that. Uh, in terms of, for example, when it identifies uh, or, you know, assigns a patient to one of the three stratas of, you know, without chronic disease, non-complex, or with co complex chronic disease, that that is less accurate for individuals, but may be accurate for identifying a big bucket of patients at each group level, yes. complexity level? Yes. I mean, it sort of assesses if you have 100 individuals, it's pretty good at saying for this hundred group of individuals, the aggregate risk is X, but you know, it might not be terribly accurate at the individual level. So maybe 50 or 60 or 70 of them are actually at high risk and the others are misidentified because it's really built more. It, those were originally built, those systems, this, I think PCMA or PMCA is, mm -hmm. is actually built on CDPS, which is a financial mm -hmm. risk system that mm -hmm. Medicaid programs often use, especially for disabled populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, I think that, that may be more in the weeds than you want to get, Jeff. But. No, but it, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. And like, I think that um, there, there are only so many kind of uh, robust tools that you can use for looking at, um, that I'm aware of, that look at, you know, um, big populations of patients and try to risk stratify, you know, the CCCs, uh, Chris Futner's work uh, with complex chronic conditions, the 3M, CRGs, PMCA. Um, and, and my impression, and, and as someone who's not a kind of data science expert, um, but I do understand that, you know, these all, you know, they're all to some degree limited by the quality of the diagnostic data uh, around diagnoses and problems, et cetera, that you, that you obtain. And that can vary based on whether it's coming from EHR, whether it's coming from claims. EHR, as you know, depends on people like us, uh, providers di you know, documenting and billing proper accurately. So there are, I think you're right that there are limitations to all of these, uh, these tools. I, the, we, we, do, we do find PMC attractive because it is, you know, unlike the CCCs, um, is applicable to you know, all children. Um, as opposed to the more narrow range of complexity with the CCCs, and then the 3M is proprietary, as you know, compared to the PMCA, which is open access. So I, um, one of the things I was thinking about as you guys were talking is some other states have started to integrate data for this risk uh, um, identification as well. And Oregon, I think, just in the last month or yeah. so, launched their program. Um, so since we're hanging out the, across the country, right now. Do you see a role for sort of trying to standardize some of these risk assessments? Um, you know, right now there's, we're doing the thousand flowers blooming, but then we have to, you know, we try to aggregate and sort and actually help states that are not this far along. It gets a little confusing for them to pick it up. I, um, I personally have always been um, uh, an admirer of the Oregon, I think it's called Pediatric Improvement Project, that, the group in Oregon, and I think they're, they're the, they have an EEC uh, award as well, is my understanding, and I've read their recent work describing their work on health complexity, really aligning medical and social complexity risk factors from big data sets. Um, I, do, I do, Jeff, think, I think that's an attractive pathway. I think there was a question asked about using skilled social workers to, to assess individual risk. risk. I, I, as a clinician, I wholeheartedly, uh, uh, that wholeheartedly res resonates with me. As I think about scalability, that's where the challenge kind of comes through um, in trying to speak a language that, um, that people can have, you know, a universal reference. So for, you know, even, you know, as, as was alluded to earlier, even tools like PMCA and all these things are, are probably imperfect. Nothing's perfect. 
um, but something that can provide some uh, shared language, I think would be attractive for scale, for scale reasons. Um, but the central tension is still, in my opinion, that even as we explore these big data tools, et cetera, I, I think if we lose that individual touch um, or some ability to integrate the individual touch within it, as was alluded to in this chat question, um, then I think we will still be fundamentally um, a little bit misaligned with the needs of parents and families because they don't see their children as data points. They see their children as individual children. That's a wonderful closing point. You know, I think that that's, yeah, it's super important. I will, uh, I will think of your Amazon standardization and your individual provider um, uh, seesaw for a long time. Um, Already, I think if there's if it's a, if any unless anybody has anything else they're really um, uh, pressed to talk about, I think we'll um, close off this part of the discussion. Again, um, um, this has been a, uh, um, a, a great presentation, and David and, and and Charlene, who's not here, we'd love to continue to follow what you're doing and learn from it as you guys um, progress as well. Um, I think we have. Um, a little bit of time left. I wanted to pass this along to our next um, our next bit of work, and I think um, if we can go to the next slide, we wanted to just talk for a little bit about this um, sustainability affinity group. And Rich, feel free to to jump in as well. Um, this group was sort of formed as a um, as a sidekick, uh, or I think I said last time, a budding yeast from the. Uh, from the uh, National Care Coordination Academy, and we've done these um, sessions. I am um, buoyed by the fact that our attendance seems to be growing rather than shrinking, and we hope that uh, the discussions have been useful. Again, we're trying to have um, states present on where they're at so we can learn from each other and then also um, pick up a topic. We flipped the discussion today because of, uh, um, of um, Charlene and David's schedule, but I wanted to uh, um, um, We'll do a little bit on waivers after this, but I, we wanted to let you know that we're going to try to keep this monthly cadence up for at least the next three months into um, the beginning of 2021. Um, we have actually worked uh, been working with uh, Lucille Packer on um, on some sustainability for the sustainability affinity, affinity group. So um, we'll see. Um, hopefully, we'll be that will come along as well and give us some um, some more resources to do these sessions. And I think the other thing I just want to say here is um, we'll send out a questionnaire, but we really want to make this uh, a productive conversation for all of you. Um, so we're glad that everybody's here, but we want to make sure we're doing this in some order that makes sense. It's a little bit hard um, to figure out, um, as I was saying earlier today, is this like my son who's the English major where the, you could take the courses in any order, but at the end of the day, you get an English degree? Or is it like my other son who's a STEM guy and you have to take you know, basic chemistry before you can take organic chemistry? So I think that we'd love some feedback about that if we're doing the right thing. Um, overall, as you know, we're focusing this on, um, on financial sustainability and measurement to prove effectiveness um, and a little bit less of a focus on the on the um, delivery models, although we certainly know that that's the case. So um, that's where we're at right now with that. Um, Rich or anybody else, any other questions or comments? I would like to make uh, the following observation for the sake of all of our participants today. So the North Carolina model um, has a whole lot of uh, a breadth to it. One of the things that I asked Charlene about in the in the chat is they have not quite consummated yet full alignment across the payers. Uh, for me, and I'll sort of reveal a personal bias, I am familiar with the kindergarten readiness measure. I think it's wonderful and, and early on it is it is a measure that when uh, fully implemented and fully specified is an elegant representation of integration, right? So it's not just are the kids getting seen and getting their immunizations. There's developmental screening, behavioral screening, social screening, et cetera. So it's really, really great. And I want to uh, thank CMMI for uh, making sure that that's included. We need to test that measure. But for, for the other teams, as Jeff said, and, and as Meg uh, Camo, uh, Beth Lynn, and, and, and Heather 
um, Renee and, and others from the core uh, academy. You're all at different places. So what can you take away from the North Carolina experience, depending on where you're at? One is, you know, is there a measure or two that would uh, garner the attention of your Medicaid program? And preferably one that uh, meets the priorities of the families uh, that, that you serve. And think about that projection and continuity over time uh, as ways of, uh, of tracking your results. So as sophisticated as the North Carolina model is and the Inc. Uh, uh, model moving toward APMs, the alternative payment uh, models are, um, not everybody is there. So stay, have, maintain fidelity to those core principles that we talked about. What's a measure? Make sure that it has implications for care coordination, training, family engagement, and measurement, and, and more to come over time, both through the SAG as well as in the academy. Great. Thank you. All right. I think we'll go on from here. We're going to spend a few minutes on uh, um, talking about waivers, just because this is a topic that's come up before. It's a little bit of a change, but I go, you have to go back to that slide first. First, when we started the um, Academy, um, the SAG, we told you we would take you to wild travel destinations. And since I have moved to Utah, um, this um, monolith we're putting up in my front yard, no, just kidding, but uh, it was great fun to see, to see, um, somewhere in the wilds of Utah and where the slot canyons are that the um, that a space alien um, decided to imitate human technology um, and make this uh, make this uh, monolith look like it came from human beings I'm just kidding but anyway um, I also would welcome if anybody else wants to send us their best travel slides I would love to uh, um, we'd love to share them as well so we're going to go on from here then um, to uh, talk about Medicaid waivers, just to do a little grounding. This is a little different than uh, a little bit of the didactic thing that we've been to, we talk about. So, um, um, uh, um, so we're going to um, go on to the next slide. So, I just want to talk a little bit about Medicaid waivers, and this is really a little bit of 101. So, first, I just I thought, how do states have an agreement um, with the feds? To Pay for their for the federal share of Medicaid, and fi fundamentally, all states have to have a state plan, which describe. And I'll talk about what that is. And then they then there's a number of different waiver categories, and these are the main waiver categories you'll see. Um, Eleven fifteen waivers. I'll spend more time talking about. Um, nineteen fifteen B or managed care waivers, and nineteen fifteen C, which actually did a lot of press, but we're not going to talk about a lot today. Are um, home and community based service waivers. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, so what's in a state plan? All states, as I said, even if you had no waivers, but every, most states do have waivers, um, have, a, um, um, have, a, uh, um, have to have a state plan. It describes the nature and scope of the services. Medicaid mandates some services like um, you know, hospitalization and, and physician services. Um, and states uh, elect to cover other services. And the, one that, the ones that are most remarkable um, that I think everybody should know about, although it's, everyone covers it, is pharmacy benefits are actually an optional coverage, um, uh, but virtually every state covers it. Um, dental services are also optional, and that gets to be a little more tricky um, um, because they're covered for kids through EPSDT, but they're not covered um, all, are not required to be covered for adults. But then um, um, other services, most notably now, have been services around substance use disorder um, are optional coverage services that most uh, states have brought in. States choose eligibility groups, and that often means defining what level of uh, federal poverty level is covered, um, um, and that varies quite a bit from state to state. Um, states decide on payment levels. Um, um, and they decide on what provider types. So if a state decides to add a, um, like uh, Minnesota did, um, um, advanced dental therapists, which, which are people who um, can actually do some dental work, that provider type has to, um, has to be submitted to, uh, to a state plan. 
states change their state plans at varying levels, depending, I think, on the culture of their state and their resources, but all state plan amendments must be approved by CMS. Um, so next slide. The other side of this is waivers and waivers um, give states additional flexibility to design and improve their programs to demonstrate and evaluate state specific policy approaches. And they're designed to improve quality and flexibility for state med Medicaid programs. And then the next slide. Um, 1115 waivers are the, were the first out of the chute and these are the ones that I'll spend some time talking about. And they're really considered experimental pilot or demonstration projects, although there's certainly a lot of them. And they've been around, um, I would say, for a, long, for a long time. The stated goals overall are to improve access, efficiency, coordination strategies, which is relevant for us, beneficiary engagement, alignment between Medicaid and commercial insurance, and then deliver innovative models of payment. So, while, for example, I know Massachusetts is looking at a big 1115 waiver around complex kids and coordinate and its accountable care uh, model of um, model, other states have done some of the same things um, through state plans. I would say that um, that state plan amendment services are almost always direct services for fees for services, which is really the history of health care and Medicaid where if there's going to be any kind of an alternative payment model, they almost all, they will go through a waiver. So next slide. Um, 1115 waivers importantly have to be budget neutral. And that means, and that's done in a way that, um, that the fiscal guys understand, which means that on a, I guess I would say on sort of a risk adjusted basis, the amount spent per for the whole group, the whole population in the waiver can't exceed what's expected to be paid um, through the state plan. It does not have to be budget neutral if the waiver expands the population. So if you go from 50,000 people into in a waiver to 100,000 people, it's more on a per person basis. Next slide. 1115 waivers are to be evaluated and they usually are five year intervals and then a three year or five year um, um, renewal. Um, the uh, evaluation is based on the waiver criteria and I'll just point out that all, many of the um, states have 11, have 1115 waivers that include their managed care programs, although I said earlier that 1915B are also managed care waivers and the evaluation does include budget neutrality. Um, and next, um, this is from Kaiser, and this just talks a little about the history of 1115 waivers. And um, just to show you that they started as broad expansions um, with the idea of savings from MCOs. Um, there were some coverage expansions in the, in the first part of this century, and then um, the expansion waivers around the Affordable Care Act. And then if you go to the next slide, it talks about what the um, um, Trump administration looked at as an 1115 waivers, and this is where I guess I would say it gets political um, in that it reflects the Trump administration's um, um, interest in, uh, in work requirements and eligibility benefit um, restrictions in some cases. Um, there was the idea that um, for a while that there could be a, um, a block grant to states, remember that Medicaid is um, is a um, program that allows um, it's an entitlement so if, if costs go up everything goes up in the idea of a block grant and then there were behavioral health um, um, uh, letters that were sent and then waivers that were applied for that were really around um, um, delivery um, of services and imds i won't get into that and around treatment of substance use disorder serious mental illness and um, um, social emotional disorder in kids so the waivers, you know, and then there's speculation, obviously, about how waivers will move now that um, 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 now that uh, we are going back to um, um, a, a different um, kind of admi um, uh, administration when um, President-elect Biden starts. Um, so if you go to the next slide, 
these are just a few things I put in from my perspective, and then we could certainly discuss this a little bit. Um, but um, uh, I would just say that states have varying capacity and interest in applying for waivers depending on their own resources and their own priorities. So we saw um, waivers around work requirements come in from some states and other states were very much not interested in those sort of things. Um, managed care exists via waiver for many and for many um, 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 programs for care coordination it exists within that system. We've certainly already talked about that in terms of what we talked about with um, um, the other states we've, um, we've had on earlier and obviously with North Carolina as well. So care coordination exists within those relationships that managed care has with Medicaid. Um, adding services directly can be done through a state plan amendment. But as I said earlier, adding services in an alternative payment model is really done through waivers. So in Minnesota, when we started doing care coordination for our patient-centered medical home, we added the service through the state plan amendment. We've, some states have added additional screening through those plans as well, but at the end of the day, um, the waivers give um, the idea of um, risk and gain sharing um, as well. Um, and then uh, um, I think I, I uh, said that the last point of this as well. So I think that for those of us who are working now with um, on care coordination and how to get the model going, um, I think I just wanted to present this because it's come up in the last couple um, SAG sessions that uh, people were wondering where their states were at and how their states were were looking at um, at um, at uh, how they were looking with their states at. Uh, um, care coordination and payments. And I thought this would give you some, some basis because I think one of the questions that I think all of us have as we go and talk to our state Medicaid leadership is, you know, are you interested in paying for the service directly? Or are you interested in paying and looking at a, um, an alternative payment model? So I hope this helps. Um, next slide, I think is, um, I think we're done, but is there anything else at the end, Heather? Or, nope, we're done. So I hope that helps. I wanted to ask if anybody has any questions or comments based on that. Um, and um, otherwise, um, um, oh, we have an evaluation thing on the, Heather, will you send that out as well, the evaluation? Yes, I will email that out and I will also email out the Google Doc as well for the attendance. <laughs> I just wanted to add because um, it wasn't clear that each state doesn't have the same waiver. So CMS can approve a waiver, but Pennsylvania may not have that waiver. Right. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, um, Renee. So um, I think that every state applies for waivers on their own. And um, there's actually, um, I get a little dizzy when I go there, but you can go to CMS and you can find every state's waivers and you can sort them by state or by sort of by topic as well. But, um, um, and I, I didn't present the stuff on waivers to try to get everybody to be an expert on waivers because I don't think anybody, there's, a, there's probably 50 people in the country who are experts on waivers and they're the people who are running it for their states. Um, but more to the point of knowing what the relationship of a waiver is to the state plan so that when you go talk to your Medicaid program, you can, um, and they start talking about waivers or their inability to apply for a waiver or their interest in a waiver, you can understand where they're coming from. Um, so you don't go in not knowing a little bit of the language. Um, Sherry said that the wait list for waivers can be super long and that's true. Also, the thing, one of the things that's been done in the last few years is that there's a, um, there's a, and I didn't, talk, I didn't say it directly, but there's a CMS scorecard now. And the scorecard is, it's sort of a, I'm going to put in air quotes, a way for Medicaid to, to judge states on how they're doing. There's a set of measures, but there's also a part of the scorecard where CMS gets scored on how fast they get back to states on, on replying to their waivers. The challenge gets to be that uh, once a waiver is submitted or a state plan amendment is submitted, the, 
CMS has a 90 days in which to respond and sometimes they get back on day 89. Um, so it's, it can, and they can ask questions and that can go on for quite a while. So I think that that's, those are important points as well. Man, alrighty. Um, so we have, I just wanna say again, I think we're gonna, Rich, anything else you wanna add or anybody else? Uh, Heather, why don't you just reiterate the link uh, for the evaluation, please? Yes, yeah, so I posted the link for the evaluation as well as for the Google Doc for the um, continuing education credits. I will also send them out by email um, by later this evening. Um, so please complete both of those in order to receive credits. I do just wanna also mention that this is our current last scheduled SAG. So we will be scheduling out um, upcoming SAG so you will get those calendar invites soon. Next. And in the background, you could hear our newest, youngest faculty member, Thomas Charles. He can't walk yet, but he knows how to measure care coordination. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Heather, for bringing him to these sessions. Um, you're going to be getting, uh, and uh, all of the groups, and so not just of the SAG, but all of the groups, uh, we've heard you. Uh, you uh, for the Academy sessions, next one is January 8th, 2021. Uh, you want more time in your breakouts. We're going to give you um, a, a, a gift in the spirit of the holidays. To inform that, Heather's gonna be sending uh, out another survey asking each of the teams what's working well, what are some barriers, and in the, uh, uh, under the domain of barriers to ask you to give us some priorities. The way the January 8th session will be structured is there will be faculty assigned to each of those topic areas. You'll be able to meet both with the state teams will have the opportunity to meet, but we also may uh, connect and virtually uh, convene uh, multiple teams, especially if you're gonna be focused on uh, some shared uh, uh, barriers and, and the facilitation thereof. So be on the lookout for that over the course of the next uh, few days so that we can continue this momentum. Um, I also wanna just quickly acknowledge uh, uh, Jeff Schiff. He does about 150 other things and he puts a lot of time and energy and effort into these SAG uh, uh, sessions. So Jeff, it's wonderful what you have uh, uh, brought uh, into the Academy. Uh, and, and I want to acknowledge that uh, with deep gratitude. And in 2021, folks, we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, to move forward with value, to move forward with identifying uh, children, youth, young adults, and children with medical complexity with needs. So stay focused on the mission, stay safe, uh, be hopeful, uh, be careful, measure, promote, and repeat. So thank you, everybody. Have a great, thanks Rich. Have a great holiday season, everyone. And we hope that you are safely able to be with those you love. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Jeff and Rich, do we want to stay on for any reason, or are you okay with me popping off? If you have a question, you should stay, and if you don't have a question, you go and uh, feed that little, uh, our faculty, junior faculty. Thank That's you. Perfect. No, I don't have any questions, but I will feed you the responses from the evaluation once we get them. That sounds great. All right. All right. Be well. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye.